Greetings out there to all of you Film Fantastic fans. I am Amanda Whittemore and here presenting the Wild Rivers Film Radio today on our official podcast of the Wild Rivers Film Festival on KCIW 100.7. And for all of those that are new to this news station, this is where... We invite our listeners to be part of and learn more about the Wild Rivers Film Festival in all things cinema. And we often have different reports from different indie films. We invite different guests and encourage volunteers to participate. They can sign up here at contact kciw.org or at info at wildriverfilmfestival.com. And we thank the listeners very much. We also have a sponsor shout out. Wild Rivers Film Festival's presenting sponsors for 2024. KDRV Newswatch 12 out of Medford, Oregon. Thank you, Newswatch 12, for making the film festival possible this year. Also, this year's film festival is brought to you in part by the Talawadi Nation, Oregon Community Foundation, the Ford Family Foundation, Travel Curry Coast, the Roadhouse Foundation, and the City of Brookings. Are you interested in sponsoring the Wild Rivers Film Festival and our mission to celebrate indie cinema on the Wild Rivers Coast? Just email info at wildriversfilmfestival.com. And today here in the news station of KCIW. We have a special guest, Stacy Bergstead. Hey there. Hi. Thanks for joining us on the Wild Rivers Film Radio. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, we like to just get right to it and learn what brings you here to the film news station. Well, I've been um, teaching a film class classic film class with the college, Southwestern Oregon Community College. And um, it's been very interesting for both me and the students. Mm. So we're hoping to spark some interest for the film festival as well. Okay. And how many people did you have attending? Um, we had nine enrolled. Um, cool. it, does, it doesn't seem like a lot, but um, SWAC has small-sized classes, so that was decent, especially for our first effort. Absolutely, and we're glad that SWAC is here overall in general in our community. The nearest college, I think, is quite far from here. Yes. Tell us more about your interactions with film. Well, actually, I'm not um, an official. I don't have a degree in film, but I have quite a large collection at home, over 350 DVDs. Oh. With my interest mainly being... um, black and white, film noir, 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, I'm a kid of the 60s. Mm-hmm. So to see a film from the 40s wasn't that far-fetched. Right. You know, it's like s- someone now watching a film from two- 2000. Oh. You know, it's only 20 <laughs> years between 60 and 40. So if you think of it that way, and then also some of these movies I'm looking at, and my goodness, it's 75 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it exciting. It's got value. Uh-huh. So we'll, so this sh- production will happen again in next year? Um, I'm hoping so. This was our trial run. Mm-hmm. So um, the college will look into that and see. I'm not sure exactly what their plans are. Right. Well, what drew you to this project? Well, um, being retired from SWAC, you know, I worked there for 17 years. And um, people knew that I had this extensive collection. Mm -hmm. Also, I have a lot of old TV. You know, I I live in the past. I like Leave it to Beaver and Andy Griffith and all those. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, and I've talked a lot about it. And so they just, it just kind of happened. We were looking for something for students. And um, there's a lot of issue about um, copyright and legalities to be, you can't just show something to anybody. So we found out we needed to make it an official class. Mm. And in that case, it opened the door and I was able to bring out my DVDs from home. Mm -hmm. You can show all the movies you want in a private setting, but as soon as you open up to the public, that's a whole nother 
situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've run into that. Uh, you know, I, I swim at the pool in Brookings, and I also teach aqua classes. And um, it's the same thing with music. You can't just play your music anymore. Mm -hmm. um, in the old days, you could get away with it, but now um, they're keeping an eye on it. Mm -hmm. And music is a huge part of the film industry and, and a huge part of the cinematography. Um, it really is. And um, being a musician and very interested in music, I tried not to go too much that way because mm -hmm. that's my own interest. And I know a lot of people are more visual and the music is just kind of background. Mm -hmm. um, I know when my brothers and I were young and my mom would be watching a Saturday afternoon matinee, we come in, it's like, oh, a violin movie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'm a huge Hitchcock fan. Me three. Major. I have almost all his movies, and I know a lot about his um, his soundtracks and his composers he used in several over and over and then they showed up in other films, too. So I really could have gone to town on that. And mm -hmm. so I just kind of <laughs> touched on it a little bit. Right. You know, there's so much information to learn about films that I had to really gear back. Um, each class, we watched a movie. Um, prior to that, I chose a topic about film to discuss like um, cinematography, the studio system, mm -hmm. sets and locations, mm -hmm. um, silent movies, actors and casting. So there's so really a lot. You know, we just touched on it. And with the time limit, we really couldn't get into it. But the students seem to like that part the most, you know, learning about that. And then after we did that, then I would talk about the film we were about to see and give them I introduction, things to look for, different um, cinematography effects, especially like from Hitchcock's silent film, The Lodger, we started with, mm -hmm. comparing to um, Citizen Kane with Orson Welles and all the breakthroughs he did, things to look for, and then on and on. And we... I set it up in chronological order, starting with the earliest at 1926, and we inched along like every four years, and then got into the 40s. So we we're able to see how things developed and the evolution. Unfolded. Yeah, uh -huh, and the progression. And in addition to that, we discussed what was going on historically out in the world, mm. because that really affected things. Correlates. Um, you know, for example, All Quiet on the Western Front was mm -hmm. World War I. Mm -hmm. um, after that, it happened one night, and that was a screwball comedy. <laughs> and um, screwball comedies had kind of certain element, elements in it, and it was kind of a, an escape mm -hmm. for people. Um, and then right after that, it happened one night, just barely slid under the wire because the Hayes Code, mm. which is a morals code, kicked in. Mm -hmm. And that went from like 1934 to 1968. And any director, producer, writer had to pay attention. And there are certain words they couldn't say, certain um, topics they couldn't cover. Mm -hmm. So was that from the AMA or which organization was? Um, I'm not sure exactly who was the one that implemented it, mm -hmm. but they all pretty much agreed. And so that had a lot to do with, mm -hmm. in fact, a couple of directors did remakes of their own films before and after Hayes Code. Right. Because they could come out now and really say what they wanted to. Right, right. And we, uh, for those who are just tuning in, we are here presenting the Wild Rivers Film Radio, the official podcast of Wild Rivers Film Festival on KCIW 100.7. We are so lucky to have Stacy Bergstadt in the radio station with us. Um, Stacy is a film 
familiar and very educated and has tons of experience, and we're just getting to learn more about that as we dive deeper. You know, the other thing, too, um, in addition what was going on in the world, like it happened one night was during the Depression era. So you could really see um, what was going on, people looking for food Mm -hmm. and jobs Mm -hmm. and things. Um, So a screwball comedy was kind of lighthearted to bring, bring people out of you know, as an escape. And then the Hayes Code kicked in right after that. And so then the Philadelphia story came out. We saw that next. Um, And that was actually during World War II in 1940. And um, the tastes in comedy were already changing. They didn't like the slapsticky screwball kind of. So it was still humorous. Mm-hmm. That was with um, Catherine Hepburn, James Stewart, and Cary Grant. And it was humorous, but not that back and forth banter type of thing, but still themes of um, husband against wife, male against female. And, um, but they, they couldn't really say divorce, and they couldn't, ah. you know, they had to present it in other ways. So, the audience could um, in, insinuate, you know, what was going on. So right. they had their hands tied, you know, in different ways. And um, Citizen Kane came out, and that was very innovative, considered one of the most famous movies ever made. And that was during World War II. And they um, actually made reference to Nazism and communism without saying it. Mm -hmm. Um, Creatively. Yes. Orson Welles was able to, with his radio background, he made like a newsreel Uh in the beginning. So he could show (laughs) flashes of newspapers and Uh um, Uh an image of Hitler, and it was probably an actor. But anyway, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, um, and then in 42, the War Production Board was formed, and that was formed to control the entire World War II, as far as America was concerned, Mm -hmm. um, where money was spent, how things were produced, you know, um, food rationing, factories were turned, like a sewing machine factory would uh, now be making machine guns or, you know, things like that. (laughs) And everybody went to work. So um, Alfred Hitchcock was filming Shadow of a Doubt right at that time. And they had some night scenes down in Santa Rosa, California. Mm-hmm. And literally mm-hmm. hours before they finished, before the blackout came down, where they shut all lights down at night. Right. And yeah, um, yeah so, you know, here's external things you, yeah. affecting um, the Hayes Code, was kind of an internal thing. But, but here's actual war going on. And in fact, Alfred Hitchcock's mother was ailing and dying over in London and he couldn't go see her because of the restrictions on travel. Oh, wow. Things going on out in the world affected, you know, Hitchcock had to change his shadow of a doubt um, set because the budget was only $5,000. They affected costs for everything during wartime. Mm Mm-hmm. One of uh, the most fascinating parts, there's so much that happens and so much that to make a film at all, to be able to protect their style or their what they're about to present before everybody hears about it or sees it. One of his films, I heard that he actually purchased every printed book and every publication ever relating to that film as he was making it so nobody could read about it or hear it or see it, which is quite a huge investment and a lot of research and time and energy to keep people from hearing or seeing about it. That's right. And in fact, um, just recently, I saw the interview of Elmo Williams with Lon Goddard for High Noon. Mm -hmm. And um, Elmo spelled out what it takes to create a film. And it's not just, oh, show up and start acting in lights, camera, action. There's all sorts of stuff that goes on before. he said the very first step is find a story. Right. And then you got to write a screenplay. Mm-hmm. 
and then you have to interest a major star. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you might be able to get other actors because the star, you know, on and on, the, the financing. And, and this is all before the camera even starts. Exactly. Let alone any of the equipment that goes after the camera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, I've seen a few of Elmo's interviews, and he's such a great resource. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, for screenwriting, we are so glad to be participating with Squawk. Swalk mm -hmm. at a college here in Brookings of having a workshop. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that they were hoping to develop mm -hmm. some programs, so that that's awesome. Yeah, more information about that can be found at www.wildriversfilmfestival.com, our website. You know, another movie that we just saw, Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. was very interesting because, and it was very bold be, because it was a comment on Hollywood mm. and kind of the dark side. Mm -hmm. And it was a story about a silent uh, film actress trying to make it and the Hollywood system's changing and everything. And um, William Holden actually played a struggling screen writer. And so it kind of showed some of the things that they had to go through. It's unbelievable. Uh, when, when one gets behind the scenes, which we're looking forward to doing quite a bit of when we have the filmmakers in town, um, that they they will be able to come here in the radio station as you are and be able to talk about these things. Oh, yes. You know, the very and to help each other out what you need to do mm -hmm. and the reality of it. It's not like, uh, you know, all these actors and actresses, I'm going to Hollywood and I'll be a star. Well, good mm -hmm. luck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> right. And that's the unique and special part about working with the college here is there's so much room and growth for teaching all the avenues, like as simple as this radio station. Starting a volunteer position is majority of the way that a lot of us found our positions is we show up we volunteer, we learn about it, we build an education, we get experience points, and then when we're of that ripe, mature point, we get hired into the big industry, and it's a good way to go. Exactly, and you look at somebody like Ronnie Howard, who started off as Opie on the Andy Griffith Show, and then he progressed as a teen to Happy Days, and then he became behind the camera, and he's one of the best directors there are, so... And that's learning by doing. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Being exposed to it is crucial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Familiar with all the things that happen, just as in any field with the hospital mm -hmm. or in the supermarket, out in the field of the position that we're aiming for. Right. Yes, I do know that SWAC has an excellent nursing program. Mm -hmm. And it's the same type of thing. You know, they start off in the classroom and little by little, they start doing more hands-on things. And then they're in the hospital. And then all of a sudden, I had to check in. I broke my arm. It's like, oh, I know you. I know you. I know you. It's like eight different people. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. We When we talked to them about creating the workshop, they introduced us to those rooms that they use. And our executive, one of our directors, he, uh, Daniel Spring, and he's asked the question, of course, well, could we film in here? <laughs> so everywhere you are is a moment and a chance to film or record or to get, keep that creative juice going. And it's just such a gift to get the classic movie feel and sensation planted at the college to really just blossom this industry. Well, that's true. And a lot of it is starts off in the mind. It's a vision. Mm -hmm. What's possible? And I love Alfred Hitchcock because he was early on and he had to come up with all these ideas of how he's going to do things. And if you know his movies very well, he rarely, if ever, shows a murder. Mm -mm. It's so it, close. It, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you fill in the blanks with your own mind. Mm -hmm. And it's just the buildup. And he's had to do stuff like construct sets where the wall moves so the camera zooms and um, cranes doing a special shot and you know those people were the innovators completely they had to come out yeah and now um bless their hearts a lot of people are able to go onto a computer and recreate a lot of stuff so it, it's a whole different world now it is it's a different brain pattern 
Yes. Mm -hmm. But it is helpful to know really what goes on behind the scenes. It's like an accountant that uses a program and they they tippy-tap and push buttons and all of a sudden a number appears where in the old days you had pencil and eraser and a... a, Long division. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So it's good to understand what's behind it. The same thing with film, you know, how it evolved. You know, there was a time when there was no color. When they actually used film, like actual film. Yes. uh, How do they call it? Ribbons, like the actual material. And something that's interesting, um, the silent film era um, was very prevalent. And there were, in in one year, I think they made 10,000 films. Mm. Well, after that whole era... Only 25% of the films still remain. 75% have been lost. Unreal. A lot of it's because they only filmed it once, didn't have backups. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is because of the actual film quality that didn't hold up. It's sad. Unreal. It just didn't take. It didn't stick to the material. Well, the film disintegrates and rots. Oh, golly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so, take a look at your cassette tape 20 uh, years from now. Right. So the storage <laughs> of the, these actual is yeah. a huge deal. Yeah. Just like it is with those electronical sticks that we have, those USB drives anymore. It, those are a good way to keep things. But yeah, think someday, about the material. Someday people will laugh at those. They will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's very true. It's still to this day, my that is my one of my most favorite soothing sounds in the world is hearing the the beginning or the end of the film reel. Oh yes, I just love it. <laughs> uh huh. Well, I remember as a student, and when it was a film movie day, with the AV guy wheeling in the real real reel to reel projector mm-hmm. and threading it through and hearing all that. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. I wish we could interject that sound right now. Press the button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are here on the Wild Rivers Film Festival News Radio, and we are talking with Stacy Bergstadt about the classical movie film course that is at the Swak College. And was there a favorite film that anybody had or was there any like major response that came or something that was just disturbing or anything like this really that stands out that we would like to share with the listeners? Yes, 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 and yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I tried to choose um, some of my favorites that were representative of the chronological order and the development. And also it was a challenge because I had to choose things that were under two hours. Oh, yeah. The class is only two hours. And we really could have made it two and a half because we really enjoyed the discussion part of it. a huge part. Yeah. So I'd say there were some that um, prompted a lot of discussion after. Um, Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt was definitely a talker. Um, Citizen Kane, for other reasons, just because of all the special effects and things that we had Mm -hmm. talked about ahead of time. And the students, a couple of them came up to me and said, you know, now when I watch movies, I'm looking for different things. Of course. And seeing, you know, so I was pleased to hear that because, you know, usually at least the first time you watch a movie, it's for enjoyment and whatever. But um, now with the pause button and the rewind, Mm-hmm. And the freeze, it's like, oh, my gosh, look at that. Yeah, it sparks the <laughs> thought process. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Very good creative insights. Yes. So um, our our next movie is The African Queen, um, 1951. It's going to be our only color movie. It's Ooh. been black and white up till now. And, of course, you know, the color evolved through filters and tinting and, mm. in fact, Gone with the Wind. Mm-hmm. Um Vivian Lee had um, green eyes, and in the book, Scarlett O'Hara had blue eyes. Mm-hmm. So those guys had to painstakingly go through, I don't know how long that movie was, <laughs> and hand change the color of her oh, eyes. Wow. They couldn't just say, you know, like on a computer, all things and, you know, what, however they do it now and click. Yeah, they had to actually go in and dab Every single oh, scene. Goodness. 
So, you know, if you think about what the early people had to go through, it was quite tedious. It's like a cartoonist, you know, frame by frame. Frame by frame. And that's about how this show goes. We're talking with Stacey Bergstadt about the classical movie uh, course at SWAC. And I want to say thank you, Stacey, so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. There, there's so much to talk about. You know, we could have gone on for hours. And that is it for this episode of Wild Rivers Film Radio. If you want to learn more, you can come and find us at, at the festival, bypasses, volunteer, sign up for sponsorship, and learn all about it at wildriversfilmfestival.com. Thank you. Thank you.